So again, I'm Oscar Agers. I'm a researcher in the Department of Astronomy and Theoretical Physics. And here we have... Um, Henrik uh, Garde. Uh, I'm assistant developer slash programmer at uh, Lund University Humanities Lab. And I should say that Henrik has been uh, instrumental in the development of this Galaxy tool that you've been seeing out there, right? So I guess you were the first to, you know, uh, to uh, accept us bothering you with the data and, and you helped us put the, make the first steps towards the Unity model of this. So, yeah. uh, I'm Nicola De Lunto and I work at the Institute of Archaeology and Ancient History here. I'm uh, Shamit Sonnergy and I head the Bioinformatics Lab at the Lund Stem Cell Center at the BMC. Matthias Vallegård, a researcher at Faculty of Engineering, working with interaction design and uh, virtual reality. Um, so let's start, I guess, we, let's dig into some of these questions. So which possibilities do you envision with VR? Okay, so something we haven't touched on here yet. First of all, is anyone from the audience now, people who have experienced this for the first time, is there anything, uh, or even for the second time, is there anything that you would like to add to this? Um, do you see this as, say, in, you know, an endless number of possibilities, or um, is it just some a gimmick, more or less? Uh, let's start with that. Yeah. Somewhere between the two. Somewhere between the two, <laughs> okay, yeah? Yeah, probably. <laughs> you think it's still in this um, in-between stage? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it will be. We, you know, as you said, we're still at the beginning, right? Yeah. So we don't know where this is necessarily going to end up. Um, you know, we've been doing this for just a year now, but <laughs> The more we do it, the more possibilities we actually see. I mean, so it's something which happened, you know, yesterday, for example, we found like a very big data set online. Uh, we managed to download it and get it into our system within just one hour. So, you know, the idea now is that, you know, you can have a, a VR room in an institute such as ours and use it as a library for data. So people can just walk in and see what they want to see for just a couple of minutes even, you know, and, and leave um, knowing what they would need, need to know. Um, so uh, we, we always knew that could happen at some point, um, but I didn't think it would happen as soon as yesterday, put it that way. Um, so I, I, I see it continuing and you know, other opportunities coming up, but I think we need to do more work on it to find out what they are. Mm -hmm. I just think it, sometimes it's difficult to know where it's going until you've actually done it, really. So what would it take for more people to adopt this technology then? I mean, what's the, what is the next step actually <clears throat> from, from what we're doing now to... Uh, yeah. Making people aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. And the way that I see it, that there's still a mental block, I think, with other people <laughs> when it comes to VR tech. They still see it as gaming technology, and that, that doesn't really help, I have to say. Um, but, but also, <laughs> I, I think VR is, it, you can't describe it. You have to experience it to really understand why it's beneficial. And at least in my experience, we have, you, you can break people up into different kind of categories, but I think the, the major block are those who, um, they, they can't see its potential until they've tried it. Once they've tried it, they love it, mm. and they can see exactly why it's necessary and why it actually helps. But that, that's the, the broad range of people that we're dealing with here. So I would say the kind of healthy, skeptical types um, who you know, need to try it to, to really understand why. Um, so it's, it's communicating that without VR, that's kind of a problem, mm -hmm. you know, because you can't get everyone trying VR, basically. So um, I think good documentation, good demonstrations really should hopefully start pushing people towards something like this. And publishing your work, that always helps. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any bottlenecks with this, though? I mean, maybe you, Henrik, has some in in mm. insight into this. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Uh, um, as a member of Humanities Lab, where we meet uh, a lot of users every day that uh, generates a lot of data and uh, they sometimes need uh, help with scripts and coding to, to cope with these uh, enormous amounts of, of, of data, sometimes in 3D, sometimes just enormous uh, amount of data. Um, I Based on that, um, I, I, I see that, that people are divided into two groups. Those that uh, take on VR with the headset uh, directly and those that are very critical or skeptical and see their everyday uh, life working with their data set is uh, more based on a flat screen and maybe sometimes they'll put on the, the, the headset and view and have this special view on, on the data. Mm -hmm. 
and I think we should um, uh, open for having both at the same time, developing our systems to, to work well on a flat screen, and then you put on the headset uh, when you like it or when you need it. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the demos we, we had, uh, I see that very few sometimes want to test it, uh, because they, they ha had already tested it and got nauseous and uh, mm -hmm. don't like to test it again. So uh, being open, op open to, to both for a while, uh, and have it uh, as an option for those that are a bit anxious, maybe. So is VR sickness very common? I don't know, Matthias, if you have any insight to this, though. Is it uh, a large percentage of people have this issue, just uh, <coughs> using it for more than a few minutes? Is that... Uh, well, uh, some people are more sensitive uh, than others, of course. But what I've noticed is that if you have really good so-called tracking, where you track the movements of the user's head, uh, like you get with the HTC Vive system, for example. I, I'm so, so far after three years of HTC Vive, I haven't, I met one person who got a little, little bit dizzy after using it for 10 minutes or something. Mm -hmm. But for the rest, there is absolutely nothing. But it, it depends a lot. Mm -hmm. For example, if your entry experience is something like something you buy at Shell and Company for 50 Swedish crowns. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that, sliding in your phone and think that, oh, this is VR, they told me Shell and Company, yeah. <laughs> That's not gonna work. You, <laughs> you will VR. be nauseous. It's, it's, yeah. it's a very bad idea, unfortunately. Uh, so you need something called uh, room scale tracking, where you really, really, with uh, low latency and high precision, track the users. Movements. And you need also fast screens. There is something called pixel persistence that uh, should be, there is a threshold value there. And modern screens are below that threshold value. It's actually one of the enablers for the new generation of VR technology to, to reach that kind of screen technology that made it possible. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would say that uh, cyber sickness, as we call it, or simulator sickness, <coughs> simulator sickness uh, is becoming uh, less and less of a problem, actually. It's a design issue as well, though, because... Also a design issue. I, I actually yes. felt terrible after 30 seconds mm -hmm. in the first version of Selectful, because mm -hmm. we, we put it into a room. It had a, a plain grey floor and grey walls and a grey ceiling, and there was no point of reference. And I felt so bad after 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. I'd just take it off, and I, I did not feel well at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but then when you open it out into outer space, you have a, a floor with concentric circles to ground you. You know, So all of these things we had to kind of learn as we went along. But you know, just having Anchor points, you know, yep. reduces. It, well, I don't feel sick anymore at all. You know, in fact, nobody has, as far as I know, who's tried using Selexel um, <laughs> since we redesigned it. Yep. Um, so, of course, you know, having anchor points and reference points really helps a lot um, mm. to, to reduce these things. So, we've not seen it at all recently. Yep. So, that brings us to education. It's very important that we get programs at uh, our universities that deal with these issues. I mean, educating people who are good in, ex I mean, designing virtual experiences in various ways. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. Did you have I'm not mm -hmm. sure this is the, I mean, we can mm -hmm. discuss about VR as a technological issue, fine. Mm -hmm. It's going to be boring. <laughs> but VR is no. much more. <laughs> I mean, if we, if we want to, to achieve, it's I good. mean, VR mm -hmm. is, it's, it's much more, in a sense that all of us experience VR every day because otherwise you are not a researcher. Because when we actually are researcher, virtual reality is our capacity of foreseeing or experimenting in our, in our head mm. and then actually cutting into place with your, with your data. Mm. That is, is philosophically speaking, that is what is virtual reality. Mm. So you, all of you, do it for doing your job. So the thing is, then what we have that is because it expands us. I mean, we can't really hold the number of big data that we have today in our head. It's too much. Few people could do it. Nikola Tesla could do it. He was a crazy person, but he could actually perform very complicated experiments in his head without actually never doing it, and then doing it for the first shot and got in the result. He was a machine. He had actually a VR implanted in his head. But this is actually the big thing, the possibility for us of using something which implement, expand our capacity mm -hmm. of simulating. Mm -hmm. So we can have this technological thing. It's not a big issue, I believe. We already have it, actually. This is only showing our limits 
in finding solutions and paradigms in how to do that. Because the real capacity of Tesla was not actually being able to handling all this data, but was also the, being able of coordinating and, putting, and creating patterns in doing this in his head. We don't have the Tesla's head, probably some of you has, I don't. But this can give us the chance of expanding this room. But we have to fill this room. We really need to learn how to move in this room. So I think this is the real challenge, not much the technological issues, because we're already there. It's more now understanding how do we actually put all this component together? How do we find new way of expanding, which is outside our body? It's a very much an ecological perspective, no? I mean, the, the, the ecological mind, for example. I don't know if you are familiar with it. It's, very, it's really interesting to see how the mind interpreted as an extent, the body is an extension, the mind is around the body. So how do we do that? This is a real challenge. We can we have the best designer, the best computer scientist on doing whatever we like in our VR system, but we will never get anywhere if we don't really think on how to do it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I would like to discuss this with you because I think it's, this is the real challenge, the real mm. true challenge. And I can add to this, we, we mentioned this in the morning talk as well, this thing about intuition, creativity, right? And, and so then you have to somehow, if you have a massive database, a, a high dimensional complex database, as, as you guys have as well, right? Then it still has to be designed in a way that you can intuitively navigate this, right? And, and, and if, you just, if it's just an SQL somehow, Framework, right? And then you know, you're, there is a bit. That's not how you want to interact with it. So, I guess it's the you have all the data. We 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 are creative people to some degree, right? And then it's just about the interaction design. For me, that's the the issue I have. Like, how would I like to approach this, right? And I think this is where you have more experience as well, right? And and, and how you can uh, how you can adapt this to the problem at hand. Maybe I don't know. Um, so I don't know if other people also have some input to this, right? If it, I guess that, it, do you see it as a problem, for example? Uh, uh, I how to make it somehow available for you to be creative, right? That's, that's what I... Um, yeah, I mean, mm. we need to experiment. We, mm. need to, we need to go out of our boundaries, mm. uh, our comfort zone as archaeologists, as uh, researchers, and, you know, experiencing, mm. experiencing dealing with other data, communicate with designers, with people who is experiencing that. Uh, which are different experience, mm. and uh, but it's a journey for us in archaeology has been uh, complicated because I believe is a is a problem of culture, uh, research culture. So we we are very much into our disciplinary patterns, and it's very difficult to go out of it. Uh, and very often these choices mm. are uh, uh, placed uh, on people, which is a very high level. But we are so they are so structured, and we as a researcher are so structured in our way of doing things which for us is very complicated sometimes to go out of boundaries. Mm. So sometimes it's actually much, you get much the freshest and the best idea from this new generation of people coming, mm -hmm. which they're actually born digital and much better used to us to go out of their uh, zone. So, so it's, it's coming. I'm very positive with it. Yeah. I believe it's coming and I believe we are lucky to be. That is actually very true because you know, we've been working on like, you know, 24 inch screens for the past 15 years and now suddenly we have limitless space. And it's like, what do you do with all this space? I mean, people ask me, you know, where should I generate this object? Where do I put it? I was like, I, I don't know. I mean, just wherever you want. So, <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> yeah. Screen real estate is not very much of a problem anymore. No, it's not. And it's, it's, it's great. It's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Um, but it can also be very disorientating as well. And I, I don't think there's an optimal way of doing it. Um, it it's mostly done on feel. But it's mostly done on, mm -hmm. at the moment, I think, my feel and probably Oscar's feel as well, which may not be compatible with somebody else's, but for the most part, it does seem to work. Um, so there is a kind of overlap in how people want things done, but we have to find that overlap and what is really optimal. But mm -hmm. I think it is very disorientating to, to go from like this mm -hmm. to unlimited mm -hmm. space. And it's a great thing to have, but you can't clutter it willy-nilly. It has to be done in some kind of ordered way um, or pseudo-ordered way. Uh, it's, 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 it's great, though. It's great having it. Yeah. Yeah, because in my field, and I guess in your field as well, it, this is a very natural extension, right? <clears throat> it, it, essentially, Selexal VR exists, existed before in some very primitive form, right? Where you had some R script or yeah. uh, Python program, right? And now it's, now it's somehow unfolded, unpacked itself, right? And, and, uh, so I think this is just if, same for me, right? We have three D data or whatever X dimensional data somehow, with, and so it's just, just it makes total sense to have this as an embodied experience, right? And, but it seems, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right, sorry. Let's send out the mics. <coughs>
And if someone else has a question, maybe you can send this. Well, keep hold on to this and. Yeah. All right. I was uh, yeah to all of you. Like, do you think virtual reality should should mimic real life and perhaps like enhance it, like you talked about with screen space, or should it be just a an escape from it, or like something completely different? What do you think is the the best way to to use it? I think I think both is still possible. <clears throat> I mean, there, there are situations where I think to myself that AR combined with a screen would be beneficial. Um, but then the thing with VR is I, I do like the completely immersive nature of it as well because it does keep you more focused on the data. Um, so I, I think there are far fewer distractions in VR because you're completely closed off. Mm. And I actually think that's, that's a good thing to do. So I, I think when you really have a lot of complex data and you want to be really focused, having it in VR actually helps a lot. I think, uh, in, in my opinion, but I, I think there's there's room for all of these possibilities right now. I would also sort of add to this as well. Yeah, I would like to more, to understand more how to collaborate in VR. Or I mean, in my my dream scenario is working on a project with us five here, right? And we have the data here sitting uh, floating atop the, this desk, right? And we can mm. um, and you know, which we see all the time in our favorite sci-fi movies, right? But when is it going to happen? I, I like this to be. How I work. It doesn't. I don't necessarily need to close off. I would like to have the option of closing mm. off, right? But also the option of just mm. having it in front of me, right? And then, yeah. And technically, mm. uh, that's a no-brainer today. So it's, yeah. It's but let's look back at history. I mean, we usually there is people that that are kind of genius in history and they have the capacity to foresee the future. If you take, for example, um, uh, cyberpunk literature, they already speak about the metaverse. And the metaverse is internet today. This was actually hypothesized and fully described with full stories long ago. Did snow crash? Neil snow Stevenson, crash, yeah. for example. <laughs> no? and, or also, kids, yeah. and it's very interesting yeah. because if you look at that, you say, oh, how is possible that this has already been discussed? Like Steven Spielberg, he wrote, I don't only know the name of the, the movie. It was very famous, Il Taglierbe. The, the, um, yeah, the lawn movie, man. Yes, it was very famous. I mean, all this, it started already in the 80s with the filmography and literature, we were actually already looking at this. And it's interesting because you can see in literature the fact that at the beginning, virtual reality in a technical way, as we define, was definitely to let us living a different reality. You plug into a cable and then you were somewhere. There was also a lot of very uh, trash TV series, American TV series, like mm. Cyberman, and all this was really cool. But then <laughs> actually, okay. more and yes. more, Exactly, exactly. Yes, Start, yes, smart, yes, yeah, yes, exactly. Yes. But actually, mm. more and more, this has been reviewed as something that is cannot substitute reality, and the real uh, scope should not be that, but it's actually doing something more, implement, doing something that you can do in here. Mm. For example, what you show in your experiment, uh, the first time I saw it, it was extremely interesting for me, because I used to instead reproduce something which is in the reality and eventually revisiting, but it's still something which is looking like reality. But when I saw your experiment, I thought, damn it, I mean, this is something that you can never do in reality. You can never jump into this and doing that, as well as actually you are doing. So for me, it was really interesting because I saw these are two different typology of using mm. virtual reality. None of them is reality or similar to reality, both implemented, but I believe it's an illusion to use it to think mm. that can substitute anything in reality. And it's not really the point, because it will be boring. It was much better. Actually, we do Pompeii. It's much better going to Pompeii. It's a much better place, and they have much better food so, <laughs> than in a winter reality. So, okay, so yeah, but it's interesting. Uh, yeah, okay. cyberpunk. Anna, do you want to add a So we've long had this problem when publishing that we have flat plots and you know one uh, variable against another variable and now with vr we can visualize multivariable data sets and we are coming to a point where you guys are going to be publishing is how how are we going to share the vr data between researchers i mean when you publish and you want to say oh and i found this correlation here in this 3d space the readers of that publications are going to want to examine that themselves. So how are we going to <coughs> you guys want to start publish? Off, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's I not have easy. my take as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not easy. Go on, you. Well, I think Adobe and others are already working on this. or I know they are working on this. And there is, for example, uh, it's not the standard. It's more open specification called WebVR being uh, experimented right now by uh, 
Mozilla and other companies. And uh, there you could think, for example, of having a part of your online paper, a little uh, container with your simulation. And if you click it, you come into the virtual reality version of that one. And on a you flat could... screen? Or Sorry? On a flat screen? Or no, no, no. You, on... you click <clears throat> on it and then somehow it communicates with your goggles and you take on the goggles instead. Okay. So it instructs you to bring on the goggles or something like that. So. We have a long tradition in, uh, in our field of uh, this and actually like one and a half years ago has been the first publication, book publication completely in 3D from the Michigan University Press, a book about Gabby. Goes, Gabby you know, it was done by Rachel Opitz, she's a senior lecturer in uh, Glasgow now. Uh, but depends, if you want to associate text with a 3D model is one way of looking, which could be the same as you were describing. You read the text and then you have a 3D model, which you, that is a, is a very old way, in a sense, and it's very easy. A 3D PDF already do it since a long time. <coughs> LVCA allow actually internet archaeology, allow, for example, to publish your 3D model interactively together with the text, but still it's a narrative, one line narrative with a, with a, with a model which you manipulate or move to understand. Instead, the work of Rachel Opitz, which is fantastic, well, actually, they actually use Unity 3D to make a real publication. Basically, you are in a virtual space, in your screen or whatever, and actually have a database <coughs> connected with all the archaeological context, and they propose multiple narratives by which you can basically see the context excavated, reconstructed, with all the sources used basically for the reconstruction and for the analysis. And the main challenge, and what I really like of, of Michigan University Press, is that they took this as a 10 years investment approach to see if this will survive in 10 years. Because the problem of all of us as academics is that publication is our career. So if you do something which has no impact, you know, it's problematic. So if you do something which cannot be used anymore as a format problem in few years, basically your impact factor disappear. And so that's why it's so difficult for moving from a paper public. So it's not really a technological or technical issue, it's more, again, mm -hmm. a cultural issue, which is connected with our professions, mm -hmm. all of us, no matter what. So we'll come out many solutions, but there are two things to focus, I believe. One is the paradigm of how we're going to see our data. Because when you make a 3D simulation, it's very difficult to identify a narrative but the narrative is what characterizes your interpretation. So leaving the other people this build their own narratives inside your own paper is not the scope, is not, is not the point. So it's very complicated. So I found, if you have the chance, give a look on the Rachel Opitz work. It's really, really, really <laughs> ahead, in a sense. It's really worth to look into it, to see. Otherwise, you have PD, 3D PDF, but it's nothing new, really. Mm. So, I mean, even augmented reality that you open the book, and you see with the glass, the, the, you know, the object popping up, the simulation. It is very interesting, fantastic, but still, we're still in the same line. The thing is, all the journals are going to have to get on board with this anyway, because <clears throat> this is why you pay your publication fees at the end of the day. <clears throat> so they have to keep up. So they're, they're now moving from paper to online, um, and, and VR is going to have to be part of that. So I think Nature published a very small news piece at the end of April talking about the apparent rise of um, VR in medical research and the kind of thing that we do. So they're all already aware of it. Um, so they're going to have to change quite quickly uh, and do something like what Matthias just said, really, and make it more widely available so people can be in the same environment that you've created, that you've reported in the paper. Yeah. And you also see that uh, if you uh, publish uh, an article on uh, something that involves code, you'll have a reference to some, uh, somewhere to take that code and use it uh, yourself, or a video that explains what you do. Uh, I've seen that. And uh, we've thought of, about this uh, when we are talking about this uh, uh, VR framework that uh, will lower the, the, learn, the, the steep learning curve uh, that... Uh, a game engine uh, has uh, to realize your data set in, in, in a VR environment. Uh, to make it possible to, um, to make this, this journey through your data set uh, and click on and off features and highlight things you want to tell and show with your data set and keep that uh, journey as a, a simple data set uh, outside this VR 
experience. So if, if this uh, we are uh, uh, app uh, will die in, in a year or 10 years or a month, uh, and don't worry, you still have this uh, journey through your data set and your data set, will, which will last forever. And someday you will uh, put that into the new version or another version of a VR and it will live again. So that's what we have talked about, uh, could be a way of telling your story in, in VR. Okay, I think Philip had a question. So Anna, can you give the mic to you? Yeah, you already have. Good, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think I would like to take the, 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 uh, the other stance, and this is... The re I really don't want to defend commercial publishers, but I think the major reason that uh, dynamic graphs and so on are not the standard in publications is that there is actually no need for it. Mm. And uh, essentially, I've seen it sometimes that there would be, uh, in some paper, there would be a dynamic graph and that I could play around with the parameter and see, see something. And essentially, Every time I see this, I think, well, the authors didn't do their job. <laughs> yeah? They should select the proper parameters yeah. that tell the story that they have to tell about their research. Um, and in the end, you then get a static I can I first thing. thing. It's okay. And uh, I see, for example, what uh, your Nikodos example is, is there's an obvious benefit that when you, let's say, have a, have a vase which is painted from different sides and you really want to see how it, how it looks three-dimensional, there's an obvious benefit for it. Yeah, I, I immediately see that. Um, but for most of the things I really... Um, the art of writing is to... So when, when you think about what is the good model to, to, to uh, communicate science, I think the paper really with carefully selected two-dimensional graphs, I think it's, it's going to remain mm -hmm. the thing. Yeah, and you know, I just want to add to this, and so I may play devil's advocate against you now as well, right? So be a bit conservative. I also think for the things we do, so you do turbulence theory, essentially, and I, it, it relates very well to what I do as well. And to me, okay, and, and, and I'm, very, I'm extremely open to all of the, you know, to how you guys would work on this, but my take on this is that you use this, at least on a very sort of basic level, you use this to explore a complex system for, and ultimately you have, you have govern, you know, laws of physics, you have a mathematical theory, and you're looking for the variables that govern the physics some, to some degree, right? And at the end of the day, it will be entropy, entropy, whatever you have, right? Uh, and, and, and you will discuss this using your mathematical theory, right? And, and the tool you, you, you use to discover this could have been your head, your pen, or VR, right? But, but in the end of the day, you ha your narrative in the paper is about the mathematics, right? But that's how we work, I guess. So now I want to hear a backlash from... Uh... <laughs> okay, so that's, yeah, yeah. So I, I would agree to some degree with what you're saying. Yeah, and, yeah. Can I? Yes, please, yes, please, yes, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <clears throat> it's wrong. <laughs> yeah. So I think someone more expert in linguistic or language could definitely highlight here the problem more than me, but let's take it from my perspective now here. So you are a mathematician, right? You speak mathematics, yeah. and you believe that mathematics is the best language which can describe everything happening in nature. I know I'm the only one or the f one of the few in humanities here, so I know. <laughs> so I'm talking to all of you, okay? <laughs> that is not true. That is a lie. So if you wanna, if you wanna, yes. Heretic. I love, no, I love having the queer. Let me, <laughs> let me tell you that. You've been brainwashed. I no, completely, I completely agree, brainwashed. which is a great language. I completely agree, which is the, the, the language of science. But if you wanna make, and if we wanna make a step forward, we need to start speak multiple language. And eventually, using your own language to understand other things. The major impact publication, nature, all the biggest one, what they're interested in, not in your work, not in mine, but is in what comes in between the two of us. This is actually where things are happening. So I agree that it's much more comprehensible for, for you or for your species <laughs> <laughs> in mathematics to understand each other if you use a common language, but that is not challenging. 
and our job is challenging. So if you instead try, it doesn't matter if it's VR or 3D, I'm not talking about that, to force yourself and really to try to make what you do clear for others using different metaphors, a different language, this will open so many bridges and will enrich so much your work mm. that will really have an impact, I believe. This is my, my point. And I don't speak many languages in this sense, so I feel it as a problem for myself itself. We're really close to the boundary of our, we're trying to grasp, you know, to go out, but sometimes it's complicated. So I don't know, I understand it's just the two of us. <laughs> and so, you know, and I'm close to the door, so I can run away <laughs> closer. But, but I really believe we, we really need to start thinking to mastering more languages, otherwise we will not go anywhere in a sense. The thing is to, to mm -hmm. kind of answer the points about dynamic graphs, I mean, I, 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 I agree, but the thing is you have to think about how papers are consumed. They, they're called papers because they're printed on paper, and that is the most <laughs> convenient form to read a paper, you know. So um, it, it would get incredibly annoying, and I agree with you. If, if when you print a paper out, you know, there's a big grey box where there was a <laughs> dynamic graph because it can't, you can't do it on a piece of paper, you know. <laughs> and it, it all comes down to how do you consume science? You know, some of us maybe read it on the toilet. I'm not going to have a VR headset on my head when I'm sitting on the toilet. So, <laughs> you know, but at the, so, no. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm already doing that. Conservative. <laughs> I'm not. Quite, I'm not quite there yet. You know, maybe that, maybe that day will come. But I'm not quite there yet. But nothing will replace the the the, the paper. So I think you're right in that respect. That you know, having you know your pre-selected parameters and just showing a graph illustrating your point. I think the whole thing about dynamic content should be shunted into supplementary more than anything. Okay. Um, that's the way that I would kind of envisage, envisage it being like an optional thing to a paper. But I think the paper should be a paper and the, the, the graph should be done in a way where they do communicate the message very clearly without the user having to play about with it at all. So, mm. I mean, y you have to keep the paper as a paper because they are consumed still as paper, and that's, mm. we have to bear that in mind Good as point. well. Yeah. Good point. <clears throat> do, yeah. Do you, yeah, but yeah, before we move, do you want to respond to this, Philip, or no? Are you you're happy with the... Uh, <laughs> Because, because, yeah, because, no, 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 because, I, because, I, no, because, I, okay. no, okay. I think this is a good point. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well. I, I, sorry, because I think it, it comes back to what constitutes a result, right? In, in some, in, or yeah, in our disciplines, right? That we, we traditionally would not consider anything else than what we just discussed, a proper results, right? Or, uh, is that what you're after, or? Um, I guess what, what, what Nicola was after is that, and which I do agree with, is that we have different audiences. Yeah. And um, I mean, the, the, the sad truth is that, as we all know, our audience that generates our academic survival are our peers. And, uh, and you are not my audience because you are in a different field. <laughs> and uh, and so, so therefore, I don't, I don't write for you. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> yes, if if it's if a nice I, record, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it, it's the same truth, it's, right? Yeah, 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 we 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 all know it. Um, so I, I I guess that um, I, I agree with you that uh, you VR offers lots of potential, and and I think w uh, your project has demonstrated it, and and the app with with the the, the planet app where you can interact with, uh, with, with the planets and, and, and with gravity in, in, in the VR lab is another great example of, of outreach um, that, well, it's, it is science, but it is for a very different audience. It's not for our peers, it's for people from outside the field, maybe for kids. And uh, so I guess there, yeah, there's tons a sense of response. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. Do you want to, yeah, yeah. So we have a question up here, I think, yeah. No, no, Unless a Nicola very quick statement, to. then a, a question. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really an architect, so I'm... Uh, so it's not virtual, good. Uh, it, it seems to me archaeologists dig up the research output of architects who know mathematics. So I, I think they do share some things. Old buildings are actually often astronomical calculators. But my, my point is, um, it seems to me VR allows you to see how people process data. So there's a division here between VR being used to explore data and VR being used to present data, mm -hmm. and we shouldn't confuse the two. Or the third one, VR, is presentation of data. But one interesting thing about an interactive graph is you get to see how people have presented the data, and you can forget the data and take the uh, algorithm, if you like, and use it for completely different data. So I don't think it's quite the same problem, but I would say that paper is in a way dead because no one outside of academics seems to read paper anymore if you talk to a journalist. 
So there is a problem there. Thank you. Do we have, I think, Mayan, were you, you were first, I think, yeah? The um, and then Kim, and then, yeah. So I'm not going to uh, add to Nikos' um, other discipline bashing here. Um, <laughs> because, in fact, we're the two people most hated in the room at the moment. Anyhow, I wanted to... So, so you've already raised issues concerning technology and you've talked about um, kind of the, the, the possibilities of VR as a, as a tool for scientific analysis. I kind of want to raise another issue or challenge which is that when you live in my sort of fields where we talk about, let's say, language and cognition and things like learning and so on, and even the perception of stuff, um, there is, and, and if you then work on, on with VR data or 3D data, there's an enormous pressure from outside to move immediately from basic research to applications. So to give you an example, if you have um, a beautiful version of a villa in Pompeii, then immediately the educational system will come along to you and say, oh, this is fabulous. Can you, can you build a tool whereby we can use this for teaching X, whether it's Roman history or something else, or in my case, you know, learning a foreign language. You can build a virtual teacher, a virtual native speaker of German or whatever, and then, you know, we stick that into schools and we can improve learning. That's, a, that's an enormous mm. challenge for us because we, of course, then have to say boringly, um, no, <laughs> we don't know that you can learn German from a, ver you know, a virtual a VR teacher. So, so for us, there is this enormous pressure to move from, from incredibly rudimentary basic research immediately to, mm -hmm. I mean, not, not only commercial, but to products and applications before we're ready. So... And, and this is a sort of a different um, uh, view on the kind of the issues. Is this yeah. simply a visualization tool for um, outreach and a different audience? Is it a scientific tool or is it kind of a stepping stone for creating applications that we can take into classrooms and, and so on, right? Any and, thoughts and this, on this, and this issue? this pressure comes from the Swedish school system somehow, the politicians? I mean, what, what No, look, the, it comes from it comes mm. from funders. It mm. comes from mm. the educational system. It comes from um, people who think that there are commercial possibilities here. Mm. And in fact, we could talk about the publishers, if you wanted to, right, um, as, as a, an arena of industry where they're interested in this sort of thing and they're, they're quite keen to draw on on fairly early stage types of, of findings. And again, I come back to this, that we don't necessarily want to engage in it because again, if, if you're in the game of looking at cognition and learning, then you want to do the basic research mm. first and look to see how is it exactly that, you know, you guys, the um, astrophysicist, how do you interact with your data? Do you actually learn in a different way from the data and so on? This is a, a, a field of study in itself mm. that we want to delve into before we get engaged in commercial things. And I'm sure you have things to say about and this. And the sad truth is commercial interests couldn't care less. Precisely. I mean, it's the same in the app industry, for example, with digital learning tools, which, uh, I mean, we have a researcher group here at the University of Agneta Gulsamang Sakia who focus on this, and they know better than anyone else what, I mean, what they're up against these commercial interests. And as I think they say that 99% of the learning, digital learning tools that are produced for kids in school are just pure shite to, <laughs> pardon my Scottish. Yeah. You have to edit that out. <laughs> <and then. laughs> yeah. Um, okay, it's okay, that's interesting. Okay, so it's... And it will be it's even worse in the field of VR, believe me. So this is very but, rapid... But, sorry, but actually, no. my point isn't only that there are kind of issues here about moving towards applications, but also, you know, some of the things that you've already been talking about, like you need proper design to, to ground yourself and so on. A perceptual psychologist could have been able, you know, could have told you that you need something like that because you're, you're interacting with data in an entirely different way. So my point here is that there is... Uh, there's a whole kind of additional side to even using it as a scientific tool that requires us understanding how yeah. exactly you do interact with it and how you learn from the yeah. data and how you look at it in new ways and so yeah. on. Um, and we are right now, we only have your word for it that, yeah. that it works, if you see yeah. what I mean. And we're very, very eager to start up research on that. And Diedrich, for example, is uh, something he talks a lot about. And maybe we'll talk a bit about in an hour or so. I mean... 
how you get <laughs> how you get in eye tracking into this. I mean, actually try to s reveal cognitive processes, what's happening inside the brain of the researcher when you interact with this data and so on. But there is a bit of an arms race as well right mm. now because people want to get their software as quickly as possible. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so I think in, in what we do, you know, VR is starting to come up. There are a couple of VR apps already to do things like confocal microscopy and stuff like that. And um, the UI is not great, but it does the job. So at the moment, I think we're at the it does the job stage because we can still publish this stuff um, at the end of the day. But at least when it comes to Selexal VR, you know, I've always been insistent that it should be a tool for analysis. And of course, people have said to me, this is great for education, it's good for outreach, but I don't care about those so much because that doesn't get me funded at the end of the day. Uh, I, can, I can publish an application that helps people do work and analyze data, but I can't publish an outreach application. And that in turn doesn't get me funded. Um, so uh, it, it's a case of, you know, well, what do we need to keep going at the end of the day? And uh, it, it is a functional piece of software that does something extremely useful for researchers. And that has always been the, the central remit for Selexal VR. You know, any, any outreach or education for me is just a bonus, uh, but it's not, it's not the focus of what we do. Um, it can't be that for the time being. For us, it's even... Uh, worse because in archaeology, of course, this is the major uh, one of the major issues. And I was in touch with several colleagues in Italy, for example, where they have a lot of fundings, mm -hmm. but mainly for doing this. So they're not happy because this is not their work. And our work in archaeology is not communication; it's actually investigating the past. But I can tell you. So we, we decide, for example, in the lab to to drop that that line at the moment because it's uh, it's another research line. And we are actually um, organizing several sessions about the epistemological role of 3D models. So uh, the question is, are these, these models giving us something new? And for us, it's easier in a sense because it's a really a yes or no. I mean, you have a 3D model, you make your analysis, and then the archaeological site come or come not. So it's really, you know. And interesting things is that um, we got very fantastic results. So we could really prove and, and we published that really also traditionally that we could discover a lot of new information before impossible to achieve. And on top of that, now we're collaborating with the police, the Swedish police and in Mal, they contact us. They joined our last excavation because they think that they could use the 3D GIS system in their crime scene investigation. So, so they came, they learned how to do it and now we are actually writing grant with them in the VR to actually build a kind of collaboration between us and them plus other centers to create actually a tool for that. And it's a great, now they, they've asked if we could go in an homicide scene, which I'm not really relying on. So we only work with bones, you know, <laughs> there must be bones. Uh, flesh is not really my thing. <laughs> but still, you know, you see how when you start coming with results, uh, these start immediately having an impact. So it's, it's really, mm. but I'm very keen in the, in the, because this is very important. What Marianne was pointing out is crucial because we, we really need to be, to understand how our action changes and the results can be actually the other indicator for understanding if something has changed. Because there have been majority of 3D models created in my field are absolutely useless, totally useless. So, yeah. Okay, so we had some, yeah, we're going to return to the funding question a bit later, I think, mm -hmm. as well, it's important, but yeah, question from Kim. Mm. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'm from the education side, so I'm going to ask, can I have a good thing that I can use in my classroom, please? <laughs> and also, we want to do research, because as you were speaking before, you were talking about that you don't want to use this because I don't use this to communicate with my peers basically, but this could be good for outreach and school children. So we are especially interested in how you make the transition. Why do we use certain resources when we teach our kids? And why do we use certain resources when we do research? And what is, how do you transition between them? And we think VR could be a very good tool to test this, because you can have a very cool experience as a kid in a galaxy, basically. You just see lots of stars and stuff. And then you would slowly transition into figuring out, oh, this green stuff means there's a lot of oxygen there, or this, this 
structure means this, and you can you make the transition. So it would be interesting mm -hmm. to use this tool to see how people make their transition from just being a cool thing to be using to use it as a research and see where they learn different st things, what they discern basically. So would this be you know so. Is there a demand then for, I mean, is this about space education essentially, right? Uh, is it, yes. Is, is it not good uh, enough as it is now? Maybe that's a provocative question, I don't know, but uh, is uh, that... Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, were, so, uh, yeah. there were a study in Oslo last year, this year, basically, which looked at young students or below 15, I think, where they just looked at which is bigger when you go from a planet to a star to a galaxy to the whole universe. And basically 50% got it wrong, which, which was bigger between plan, uh, planet and a star. Hmm. So this could help, at least in that part, to just see this is yeah. a solar system, basically. You see planets and you see stars and stuff like that. So you get a lot of free information that the elves that are assumed that they know before, mm -hmm. but they are never told. Yeah, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, this concept, these very fluffy concepts of scale, distance, uh, relative size, things like that. And we did, uh, we and we, but one of our best students did an extremely interesting application called, uh, how do you say, Spaced or Space Ed. It's a bit, yeah, word joke there. And uh, basically, it's a virtual solar system where you can choose between four or five rooms. In every room, you do one specific thing. So, for example, in one room, you get the feeling for gravity. So he implemented uh, real Newtonian gravity in there, and you could you have like a moon machine. Push the green button, and it will produce moons for you. And you throw the moons on planet Earth, and just see what happens. Can you get the moon into a proper orbit or not? What happens if I throw too hard? What happens if I throw too far off and so on and so forth. Yeah, and we are, we are very like interested in the exploration aspect, how you can yeah. vary aspects, changes the size, does, does the model depend on the color? What happened? Oh, mm. probably doesn't <coughs> depend on the color, but it depends on the size mm. or the mass and stuff like that, so they can test and try out different things and yeah. see if they can learn mm -hmm. through those experiences. But the thing is, what, you, what you're asking for takes time to do, and we don't, we don't yes. get paid to do this at the mm. end of the day. I mean, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There, there, there is no financial benefit for me to, to do this for you, and that's a real shame. I mean, I think the, the, the funding for this has to come from central government or somewhere to, to provide these educational tools. Asking people like us to do this on the side of what we do during the day already. I mean, technically, Selectable VR is already a side project. So what you're saying here would be like a side side project, you know, which none of us really have any, any time for. So I think there has to be some kind of central um, initiative to actually, to actually do this and provide the, the people and the money to produce these educational tools. I think to do this on the side of what we do already, I, I think it's actually very, very difficult. I mean, something like, you know, the galaxy and archaeology, I think these, these are things that kids can kind of appreciate because, you know, they've heard of galaxies and archaeology, of course, and their buildings and ancient buildings. But for what we do, for example, it is too, uh, it is too difficult for a thing for a, a kid to grasp at least um, you know I have had the outreach uh, outreach thing pitched to me saying well this would be great for that but I, I, I don't think it would be in that respect um, so yeah I mean I, 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 do, I agree the kids the kids do need this stuff but it's, it's who's gonna do it really at the end of the day yeah but there are initiatives ongoing like we will talk about later I mean you know but the wisdom stuff and uh, LTH Science Center and everything Going on, and there is also uh, an initiative to uh, build a national infrastructure for visualization uh, from the as I in mm. English. Completely forgot. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I mean, there are a lot of things going on, but I agree, it goes kind of slow. I'm also very impatient. I want things to happen now, 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 now. But these processes are so incredibly slow, and in the meantime, Chinese researchers and companies are just mass producing stuff with the average quality, <laughs> to yeah. put it diplomatically. Mm. Did you have a... Well, if, yeah. if the goal is to increase the quality of the, I mean, t t the learning process, I don't think virtual reality is really crucial in this sense. Uh, mm. um, we have, uh, for example, I was reading about uh, role gaming. Uh, there is a sociologist, Giuliano, based at the uh, University of Rome, made a lot of study about embodiment and uh, how people uh, learn or used to learn in the past. 
So technically speaking, you could bring your, your, your classroom in a theater and they will actually explain probably Shakespeare in the best, uh, best way possible. I mean, we already have these tools if you want to make something different, really. So I don't believe that that's the, the, um, any system can really create embodiment as far as there is the person really willing to be embodied or a person which functions as a media to let this other group embodied. The point of Giuliano was extremely interesting because he, he, he focused on the fact that in the past, in the tribes, in the shamanism culture, you have one person which, using natural effort, could actually let believe stories to the old tribes, just actually changing the, the voice, just using creating an atmosphere and having a good story. So I don't think really uh, uh, it's different because we all teach at the university level, which is a different thing, you know, because you have the people sitting there, they were really, they actually Sometimes they paid money for, you know, they, they, they really want to learn because that's their career. But it's not the same dynamic when you go for dif a different stage. So I, I'm out of my, <clears throat> you know, in a sense. Uh, but still, I, I still believe that the embodiment of the really high quality, a book can actually do the same. You can just read a book and never can stop it because you're completely embodied in that environment, mm. totally. So again, I don't think it's a technological issue. I don't think we need apps or application, as Marianne was saying before, because we don't know how they will respond. It would be a great investment, which is totally waste of money, completely waste of money. We need to try it first. And I believe we need to rely probably less on technology and more eventually in the relation between humans and technology or how humans use technology, because that is more, more efficient, I think. But, but again, I'm not an expert, so I don't know mm. in all the stages. So, uh, is it related to this? Otherwise, it's yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, yeah, comment on this, and then I'll like say after that. Yeah. No, I, I'm just thinking that maybe, or because I also come from an audience perspective in a way, and I think that what you're doing with with the interfacing and the how to understand the data is already moving the data closer to understandability for a wider audience. Because it's way easier to understand the universe in the way we understand it here than in bytes and bytes of the terabytes of tables, right? So in a way, what you're doing is already taking it closer to intuitivity. So I find this is, this is in a way, the education system should be happy that this process is already happening here. And it's not that far a leap to understand, to get in closer at least to the data for, for a student, for example. So I think this is like this is my hope when I look at what you do because I can interface with that. It's hard for me to interface with a huge data set, right? Because it's already on an uh, iPad level in terms of interfacing. Yeah, this is my point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we do Alexei, yeah, so, yeah, and then we should wrap up the discussion. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, yeah, and then we should do number two. Yeah. Okay. Right, so uh, about data exploration. Uh, so uh, when it comes to user interfaces, uh, what are the prospects of incorporating coding and VR? For example, can we make a VR version of Jupyter Notebook or something like that? Well, you can, uh, you can address uh, Python shell and call your library of uh, scripts you have there and just save the results and fetch it from inside. But you mean basically coding in VR somehow, right? I well, guess what I'd like yeah. to say, I mean, like, uh, quite often when you work with the data, sometimes you'd like to change coordinates, so introduce some new functions, set some, some multiply something by something mm. and plot it or something like that. So, and really, I mean, like, in, in the workflow, how would it be really? So, like, would one have to put it on, uh, explore it, put it off mm. code, put it on, explore it, or can one do it in, like, one simpler? Kind of workflow. Mm. Uh, the, the plan is to implement it, uh, it uh, in, in this way. You have your, your favorite scripts or uh, you add scripts to a, a folder and whatever script you have in this uh, folder uh, is accessible from uh, the interface. Uh, so you just select your script and maybe you have parameters uh, you choose and then you activate and you get the results. Uh, highlighted or added as uh, some feature in your data sets in VR. That's the plan and it's possible. 
I guess one, w one would like to have something more like a visor that you flip up or down as well, right? You could program, yeah, that's, check. Right, and, yeah. but that's m maybe mm. more, more uh, to shift uh, mm. between the, the flat screen and your keyboard mm. and your mouse with something that needs controls or whatever. Uh, mm. I think that uh, if you can fade like that, you can easily uh, work with your um, toolbox as you used mm. to. Just a quick mm. comment before Daniel says something. Uh, there are already now people who are experimenting with building VR inside VR. And there are what? these two commercial 3D <laughs> modeling <laughs> softwares <laughs> out there that yeah. people are using for building VR stuff. So uh, it's happening. Inception. <laughs> yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. Okay. exactly. Don, Don, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking about what you mentioned with the sort of the visor thing, because if you can't do that, then I know that uh, some rudimentary progress has been made in sort of putting a camera at the front of the VR goggles yeah, instead so that it. you could mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering what is like top of the line in the sense of that that you can get so you can see what's in front of the VR goggles so instead of taking them off you would essentially switch from looking at the thing to looking at your screen through the VR goggles <laughs> and the keyboard so you could code with the goggles on do you know what it is or? I'm what not sure I understood the question, but I can just tell how, you... How think, yeah. good is that technology at this point? Like, but the Vive Pro has two cameras that you can technically mm. use to look at the outside yeah. world. Last but I heard someone mention that that doesn't look very good in the VR. No, games. I don't think it's good enough. And uh, this, I mean, this is called video see-through, and I think we need to have optical see-through if people are going to use this, actually. Mm. And I think that in the <laughs> not too distant future, say five years, we will have some sort of headset where you basically almost have like a choose your level of reality, so to speak. You go from real reality to virtual reality and you can put yourself wherever you want on this spectrum with some kind of optical see-through uh, display system. But so, I think Logitech have also prototyped a VR keyboard as well that renders yeah, yeah, yeah. in VR with... Yeah, they so, do track the keyboard yeah. and then use the camera mm. to track the fingers. Yeah. So, crazy stuff. I recently suggest a couple of solutions. One they do already is they, they put a camera on your headset and they allow you to type in the real world and it's augmented into the virtual world. It's called augmented virtuality. Mm. Another is you could actually use a, a video camera feed. But there are also uh, Samsung made TVs which are windows. So you see through them and then there's some chemical reaction they actually become monitors. So the technology is developing so that they can s shift their transparency, their translucency levels. Mm. But yeah. But I think that what you're talking about is, is really for kind of power users like, like us. To, what we're trying to do is select those, trying to eliminate the keyboard as much as possible so they don't have to keep flipping between the VR environment and, and going back to the, the, the computer and doing something there. So that's, I, I think it's a bit of a trade-off. Because I think if you, if you end up coding in VR, then you're almost back to square one again where you have to code and we're trying to use VR to make life easier <laughs> not not to make it more complicated so I think it's, it's very much application specific I think uh, in, in that respect I mean Magix they suggest a black back which you know <laughs> yeah. I, would, I, would, I, would, I would love that actually because the headset is so heavy sometimes I don't want to wear it anymore I just want to sit back and yeah, get jacked in that would be great back. but yeah <laughs> But yeah. the, the headset, the headset, they do have to get smaller and, and more lightweight and higher resolution. Um, but I, I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, I think the resolution thing, the, the Vario or something like that, uh, I saw, uh, which is like, you know, near retina type resolution. And I had a look on the website yesterday and it said, uh, the price we expect to be under $10,000. I was like, oh, that's nice. Just just under $10,000. So, <laughs> yeah, I can't see it happening anytime soon, but I hope, hope we do get there soon. Yeah, I think we should wrap up uh, unless there's some urgent. Did you have a, no? any other final urgent question for the panel? Um, okay, I then. Have just, uh, we, we have uh, spoken about the possibilities and uh, I, I mean the risk and the possibilities are connected together. I'm a researcher in the field, uh, an artistic researcher in digital representation. And um, what I think is... Uh, 
one of the risks and possibility at the same time it's uh, the uh, strong identification that you can obtain when you are when you are doing something uh, um, creating something also surrealistic in a, in an immersive VR, uh, world and i had audience reaction uh, when i did my phd and they take they say to me oh i i could get addicted and uh, and uh, be in, in your environment for hours and i couldn't go go out or uh, then with uh, working with children too then it's it's the it can be the the challenge is that uh, you can think you think that it's real and uh, when i was doing something interactive with uh, with uh, um, yes with motion capture too and uh, one could interact with uh, with their own body and uh, in an application that was figuring out uh, a procession then i had this reaction from uh, from children oh it was the way it was because they were so inside you are so uh, you identify to the world you are within in and then Yes, you are interpreter, uh, user, actor, player, all at the same time. And sometimes it's difficult to take distance. Yeah. Um, and then it depends, of course, if you are a researcher or another kind of audience. But in a pedagogical uh, situation, then this distance is difficult and it could be used we, we spoke with Matthias before with to develop uh, empathy and we we spoke about the the animation that you showed about the 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 little dog <laughs> that we had uh, and uh, we said that we could uh, we could uh, it's it would be easy to raise uh, uh, interest for, for, for endangered species of animals because you can also with a robot you can you can uh, uh, you can do this kind of identification and provoke this kind of a, a strong a strong affective reaction so that's the risk and possibility too <laughs> okay so I think we'll, with that, I think we're going to wrap up and move on to the outreach talks. Okay, so let's thank the panel and me. <laughs>